Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our webinar titled Transitioning to the New Healthcare Qualifications and Apprenticeship Standards. Before I introduce our main speaker, I'd like to explain a few things about our webinar platform to allow you to get the most out of the experience. All viewers will be in listen-only mode. However, to engage with the webinar, please use the on-screen panel. Using the tabs of this panel, you can adjust your audio settings and choose to see the webcam of our presenters if available. You can also use the question and chat tabs to engage with us. We expect that our webinar will be extremely popular, but our team will do our best to answer your questions and queries. During the webinar, we will be running a number of polls. To record your response, please click on the on-screen voting button when asked to do so. After the webinar, we will be providing a recording, a copy of the slides, and a fact sheet slash Q&A document to answer any questions that we didn't get around to answering today. So I'd like to hand over to our main presenter, Geraldine Dalworth. Hello everyone and thanks for joining us today. I'd just like to go through the content of the webinar. So what we're going to do is to just go through the existing and the new qualifications that are appropriate for these standards in healthcare. We'll have a very brief overview of the apprenticeship reforms and then we'll go into quite a lot more detail about each of the apprenticeships. We'll talk about planning your delivery and how we can support you with that. Think about some next steps and then we'll have a question and answer session at the end of the webinar. So I'll crack on because we've got a lot to get through. First of all, looking at the Diploma in Care Level 2, you'll see there on the slide that the six-digit number that we love so much at City and Guild is there for you to refer to and will be helpful in searching our website for the new web pages. The qualification is due to be available in January of next year and it covers both adult care and health. It therefore replaces two qualifications the Level 2 Diploma in Health and Social Care Adults in England, all of the pathways, and also the Level 2 Diploma in Clinical Healthcare Support. This qualification has been endorsed by both Skills for Care and Skills for Health, and it's an optional qualification for the Healthcare Support Worker Apprenticeship Standard. Let's have a look at some of the detail of the structure then. So the qualification is 46 credits or 460 total qualification time hours. The mandatory group of units consist of 24 credits and the remaining 22 credits can come from optional groups B and C. Group B options are competence units and group C options are knowledge units. And at City and Guilds, we felt it was really important to ensure that the qualification consisted of both competence and knowledge units within the optional bank. That's to say that if we didn't safeguard that, the qualification could be completed by achieving the mandatory units and all of uh, all of the options could be knowledge, and we felt that that wasn't a very balanced competence-based qualification. However, there's no requirement to take any of the knowledge units from options B, therefore the qualification can consist of all competence-based units. So we'll have a little look at more detail. On this slide you'll see that the mandatory unit content actually is really very familiar to you. There's nothing there that's um, that's really very different from um, the health and social care diploma at the moment. The units have been refreshed and they are uh, mandatory across health and care as it's a shared qualification. In terms of the optional unit group, there are 39 optional units in Group C, so that it, sorry, in Group B, so they are the competence-based units. And because I, I, I couldn't um, get all of the content onto a slide, I've just picked out some interesting uh, themes of the units. So 
again, there's not much there that you would not expect to see. Uh, I'd just like to draw your attention to a brand new unit that City and Guilds has developed in terms of supporting apprentices to provide evidence for the knowledge and skills and behaviours that they will need um, for the uh, adult care apprenticeship actually. With the knowledge units there are a wide range of uh, contexts in which the, uh, the knowledge can be achieved and I think you'll find that, uh, that learners will have a, a good choice of those context units. Now moving on to the Diploma in Healthcare Support Level 3. As you see it's, um, it's, a, it's a different number, 434531. This qualification actually will be available this month. It's been developed collaboratively with other awarding organisations and that collaboration was led by Skills for Health who actually took on responsibility for the employer engagement and the consultation around all of these units. The qualifications endorsed by Skills for Health and in terms of the level three it's a mandatory component of the senior healthcare support worker apprenticeship standard. Following the webinar, I will be able to email you all with a copy of the qualification handbook which we'll be placing onto our website on the 4223 Diploma in Healthcare qualifications webpage. And we're also sending out an alert to centres either today or tomorrow um, to alert you to where that handbook is stored. In terms of what the healthcare support qualification actually replaces, it will replace all of the healthcare level 3 diplomas except for healthcare support services which is going to um, remain until December and then actually will close. It also replaces the level 3 diploma in mental health care. For any of the centres offering the above qualifications um, you'll be given automatic approval for the new qualification in healthcare support. The structure is a mandatory plus optional structure, so actually there's no pathways within this qualification. It's basically um, mandatory units and a big bucket load of optional units, of which there are 177. The size of the qualification is 65 credits, 650 hours total qualification time. 45 of those credits come from the mandatory units, with a minimum of 20 credits from the optional units. There is another proviso in the rules of combination in that 37 credits must come from a level 3 or above unit in order to achieve this qualification. So let's have a look at the mandatory unit. There are quite a lot here in terms of um, health specific mandatory units. You can see there that the units around infection prevention and control are there. Safeguarding, responsibilities of care worker are shared with um, adult care. A new unit that's there is the study skills for senior healthcare support workers. Now that unit is new and has been um, commissioned basically by Healthcare Health Education England. And the idea of having that unit within this qualification is to support the progression of senior healthcare support workers onto higher apprenticeships or into higher education. I think everything else there will be very familiar to you and there are obviously the um, mental well-being and mental health promotion and understanding mental health problems which again were um, required for the apprenticeship previously. In terms of the optional units as I said there are 177 of these and they are all together in one optional 
group. However, Skills for Health have provided some guidance as to which optional units might be appropriate for each of the options within the Senior Healthcare Support Worker Apprenticeship Standard and that guidance will be available on our website. So we've obviously got there within the options adult nursing support, mental health, maternity support, theatre support, children and young people and allied health profession therapy support. And the City and Guilds qualification will include units which are appropriate for each of those particular optional. Um, I'm trying not to say pathways. That word did come out there. As far as the assessment of the qualification goes, it will be assessed in line with Skills for Health assessment principles. So observation of practice in the workplace and expert witness testimony should be the main sources of evidence for the competence units. And again, that's something that we're very used to. Assessment is generally therefore a portfolio of evidence. Apart from the unit 300, which is the study skills unit, and there the assessment will be a centre devised assignment where City and Guilds have provided an assignment brief and some marking guidance as well. So it's really important that that assignment uh, topic is agreed with the employer to make it relevant to the worker and the employer, which will engage the learner much more, I think, in, um, in providing that um, evidence. So it's a research topic uh, where the outcome will be um, a report. And all of that information is included in that assignment brief that we will provide for you. Just a little bit more information on that um, assignment there. The report, as I said, would be the outcome. It's expected that that would consist of approximately 1,500 words, give or take 10% and needs to be structured according to the guidance. So the guidance is really quite clear as to what that report needs to look like and I think that learners and centres will find that really helpful. The assessment is, um, the, there's no grading for this assessment and the, the, so the highest grade would be a pass. I'd now just like to talk a little bit about our Level 5 Diploma for Assistant Practitioners in Healthcare. This qualification is an existing qualification, it's been around for quite some time now and has been used in the previous apprenticeship uh, framework. We've carried out a mapping of this qualification to the new standard and it stacks up very well. Um, therefore, we've been able to enter that onto a list of qualifications on the Skills for Health website where we've declared ourselves that the qualification is appropriate as an on-programme qualification for the Level 5 standard. There is a link actually in, uh, in this slide where you could go directly to that um, list of qualifications on the Skills for Health, Health website. The other thing that we've done as well is we've created an evidence log for um, for learners to be able to indicate where there are a couple of gaps so they'll be able to say how they've filled those gaps and that along with their portfolio or their qualification will support delivery of the, the whole standard. The mapping document and evidence log are password protected and they are on the 3576 web page and the password is on the walled garden. Just a reminder then of the qualification structure. It's 120 credits, 108 of which would be uh, achieved through the mandatory units and then a minimum of five credits from option group A1 and a minimum of seven from optional group A2. The Assessment methodology is portfolio of evidence, including observation of practice and a controlled assignment around um, knowledge uh, of anatomy and physiology. 
There's a link there also to the qualification handbook page. So that sums up our qualification offer for these standards. We're moving on now to an overview of the apprenticeship reforms, which I'm sure you're very familiar with. Basically, the government reforms here are looking at giving employers much more control around the design of the apprenticeships, hence the setting up of the trailblazer and apprenticeship groups. Looking at the increased uh, flexibility of delivery of those apprenticeship standards and simplifying the funding system and increasing the effectiveness of training. There's also more information um, on, on these apprenticeship reforms at the link which is at the bottom of that slide if you'd like more info. Associated with the changes of course we've, we've also got changes to funding and um, I just need to remind you that the uh, SACE or STASI frameworks for these standards um, that these standards are replacing, those have now closed for registrations. Um, there's a summary there of the funding that's going to be available for these standards and actually this hasn't changed um, since the last webinar that I did. However, I do know that the Trailblazer Group have been working to try and increase the funding for the Senior Healthcare Support Worker Standard. I don't know the outcome of that at the moment. The next slide is a summary of all of the organisations who were involved in the standards development. And now we're going to look at healthcare support worker standards in a little bit more detail. So the overview of the apprenticeships is on the right hand side of the screen. I'd just like to draw your attention again to uh, the initial assessment and how important that is in order that the apprentice fully understands that not only do they have to achieve an on-programme element of, for their apprenticeship, but there's also endpoint assessment which is part of the apprenticeship and that they would not complete their apprenticeship and be certificated on that unless they'd been successful in their endpoint assessment. So it's really important that the learner understands that they've got all of those um, things to achieve. Now in this instance a qualification is not mandatory for on programme but we've talked to lots of employers and training providers who are actually looking to offer a level two qualification as a way of structuring that on programme element but I do need to stress that that isn't mandatory. Um, the employer really would need to make the decision around whether uh, qualification is appropriate for their apprentices. So given that the on-programme elements are achieved, in order to get to a decision around whether the learner is ready for their endpoint assessment, there needs to be a gateway discussion between the apprentice, the employer and the training provider. And in order to get through that gateway, the apprentice would need to have uh, the, the have achieved whatever is um, described here as gateway requirements. So maths and English at level one, evidence of having met the 15 standards as outlined by the care certificate. Going back to uh, maths and English, a re there's a requirement for an apprentice to have attempted the level two in maths and English as a gateway requirement. Also included would be that would be any qualification specified by the employer. And then in the last three months of the apprenticeship, the apprentice would need to produce an, uh, an evidence portfolio, which would be in the last uh, three months, as I said. And uh, City and Guilds will be providing guidance around how that needs to be structured. So that's it in, in, in summary as far as uh, on programme and preparation for endpoint assessment goes. The endpoint assessment itself actually consists of a multiple choice questionnaire, which is 60 questions, a practical observation in the workplace, which would be 90 minutes, the evidence portfolio, as I said, would need to be marked and, um, by the independent assessor, and then an interview would take place to sort of round everything off. 
We strongly recommend that the multiple choice question is the first element of the endpoint assessment that uh, an apprentice would attempt. It makes sense that they've um, reached that level of knowledge and being able to prove that before going on to any other elements of the endpoint assessment. Okay, we're going to go to a quick poll question. You'll see it pop up on your screens shortly. So the first question is, will we be using the City and Guild's Level 2 Diploma in Care as on programme for Level 2 Healthcare Support Worker Standard? And the answers you have are yes, no, with another awarding organisation, or I don't know. Okay, the poll results are flashing up on the screen, as you can see. It's pretty even between yes and I don't know, so that's interesting for us to know. Okay, thanks very much for that. I'm now going to whiz through these, actually, because um, I've talked for quite a long time. And um, these slides will be available for you to have a look at uh, at your leisure. So these are just indications of the kinds of things that the, the standards will be um, including in the endpoint assessment. Looking at senior healthcare support worker standards, there's a similar situation in terms of initial assessment, etc. The gateway requirements are summarised there, but actually this time the qualification is a mandatory component. And there are different options for the qualification as, as I've described previously. And I'd like to ask you actually whether you are um, whether you can give us information on which of the options within the apprenticeship standard you would be looking to offer. Okay, and the second question we have is, apart from adult nursing support, what options are you offering for the senior healthcare support worker standards? And the options you have are allied healthcare support, theatre support, mental health support, children and young people support, or maternity support. Thank you for your responses. As you can see, it, it's pretty well, um, pretty well balanced, actually. And that's really interesting for us to know. Thank you. Looking at the assistant practitioner in health standard, uh, again, we're looking at um, maths and English requirements at level two as part of the gateway, and again, uh, a mandatory qualification as I've described previously. Sitting Girls is applying to the register to become an endpoint assessment organisation for this standard this month. And so I can just summarise really the expectations as are in the assessment plan regarding the endpoint assessment. These include multiple choice questionnaire and four short answer questions, an observation of practice, a reflective journal in the last three months, and then an interview. We've included in here an outline of the grading from the assessment plan of the senior healthcare support worker as an example of how that grading So that's summarised what, uh, what the uh, apprenticeship standards consist of, <clears throat> and this here, uh, or, uh, sorry, this here describes some of the areas in which sitting girls can support you. If I just take a, a couple of 
these as an example. We're looking at some uh, CPD events for tutors and staff involved in delivery and preparation of learners for their endpoint assessment. There's obviously the networks that we, uh, that we continue to offer which are health specific and our technical advisors are there for support as of. We'll also be issuing endpoint assessment packs as part of our offer. Now, these will include information on roles and responsibilities around the, the whole process and will also support information regarding, to, uh, regarding how to set up a, a professional discussion or an interview, how to access um, the multiple choice tests, how to actually make registrations for endpoint assessment in the first place and they'll be really useful documents for you all. They will be available on um, once uh, individuals have uh, made a commitment to City and Girls to use our endpoint assessment services and will be password protected. So we'll have one of those for customers. It will include a uh, reference to uh, grading descriptors so that learners will have an idea of how they can work towards achieving a meritorious distinction, for example. And there'll be a separate um, endpoint assessment pack for our independent endpoint assessors so that they can, or we can ensure that they are going to uh, carry out the assessments consistently and they're very well aware of all our requirements in order for them to do that. And I'll, I'll let you have a look at the timeline for when various things are going to be available. I've done one for healthcare support worker level two and the senior healthcare support worker level three. In terms of pricing, our on programme qualifications are uh, there for you to, to, um, to see prices are outlined there and the anticipated cost of the endpoint assessment will be in the region of about £600. Obviously because we're not yet on the register for assistant practitioner we're not able to promote um, the, the, the pricing for that uh, as yet. It's worth noting also that there will be costs associated with racing and that's probably one of the reasons why um, we need to think about the best way of approaching the endpoint assessment and one of the reasons why we think it's important that the learner sits the knowledge test and passes that first. We're also going to be um, giving access to a new endpoint assessment preparation tool for any learners who are registered with us for endpoint assessment and this is a really exciting uh, product. It helps uh, learners to practice and, uh, and to learn about how to present themselves at a professional discussion for example, how to prepare themselves for a test, what to expect in terms of someone coming to observe their practice who perhaps they don't know and I think that this would be a, a really um, helpful tool for both learners and for those who are helping support those learners moving forward. We've outlined here and the endpoint assessment journey step by step so we hope that it's uh, really clear for you. Uh, if you just follow this from recruiting and inducting your apprentice through the on programme um, and then registering with the endpoint assessment service right through to the apprenticeship certification. I've tried to summarise here some of the um, things you might want to think about when you're choosing your endpoint assessment organisation and again I'll, I'll let you uh, read through that. So we do have an approval process uh, for organisations to offer our endpoint assessment for uh, the healthcare standards. We have a 
a form uh, which is available on our website for, uh, for you to indicate that support. And we, we need to make sure that uh, you can access that and uh, have confirmation of when you can use the sitting girls endpoint assessment product. As far as next steps goes, we'd really like to invite you where you feel it's uh, appropriate for you to join our uh, growing number of independent, independent endpoint assessors. So we've given you here a link to our web page where you can make a direct application to be an endpoint assessor or we're already talking to a number of organisations about how we might work together to provide that pool of assessors who are obviously occupationally competent and um, less than two years um, out of practice. If you'd like to take things further, we've got a, an apprenticeship consultancy offer, which you can have a, a read about there and get in contact with us. And there's lots of resources that are available, not only about individual apprenticeship standards, but also about the general apprenticeship reforms, funding, etc., and also what's coming and when. And here's there's some more information for you. We've reached the end of our uh, webinar. And uh, now I think we're ready to take some questions. Yeah, if you have any questions at all, um, please type them in the chat tab, the question tab, sorry, um, and we'll have a please and respond to you very, very shortly. Okay, um, so just a reminder, if you have any questions or any come to mind, please put them in the question tab. Um, so Geraldine, quick question for you, will there be a decontamination qualification developed? There's actually no apprenticeship standard, to my knowledge, um, which would in include decontamination as a specific job role. I think that's something that you would need to refer to um, the Trailblazer group, or in fact there's um, on the government, on the .gov website around apprenticeships, you can actually suggest uh, apprenticeships to be developed. So that might be something um, to do. Okay. Um, where do you get the guidance for how the portfolio should be structured? That will be part of our endpoint assessment pack, so that we will give that information to uh, those customers who are going to be working with City Gills on our endpoint for our for their endpoint assessment. Got a quick question here. It says one slide suggested that the new level pre diploma would replace all existing qualifications I've seen except the mental health, but the new one contains a mental health option. Could you please clarify this? Yeah, as I explained, and obviously um, happy to, to confirm, the, the mental health diploma, the 3101, has basically been incorporated into the new qualification. So it was felt that it was probably more accessible to learners, in fact, to have a, a qualification that was mandatory up and then a big group of options rather than to create pathways which was felt could possibly create some barriers for some learners. So when you see the content of the, um, of the qualification, you'll see that there are a number of mental health specific units 
in there that would support someone working in a mental health centre. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we are an approved City Guild Centre for Health QCF. Am I right in understanding we would receive fast track approval for a new qualification? If you're an existing centre for the health qualifications at level three, then you would have automatic approval for the new qualification. Okay. Um, also asking, following on from that, can I check about approval for endpoint assessment? Would we need this if we were delivering a new qualification but not planning for endpoint assess? No, you would only need approval for the endpoint assessment if you were intending to offer endpoint assessment to Tico. Okay. Um, for the level two standards, they are required to attend the level two maths and English. Yeah. If they are doing functional skills English, does this mean that they have to attempt all three elements, e.g., the writing test, the reading test, and the speaking and listening element? Actually, that's a really interesting question. Um, I'm not sure that they would have to have attempted all three elements or one element. So I think we need to get back to you on that. Sure. One. Okay, Stephanie, we'll get back to you on that one. Um, got a question here from Lee Hockaday. Does the new level five replace the care leadership and management? No, that's a separate qualification. So the assistant practitioner level five that I've talked about here is specific for healthcare. The um, adult care leadership and management qualification that exists at the moment is also being replaced and that new qualification will be available in January. I'll be talking about that at the webinar. Um, not many questions left. If you have any more questions, please, please send them through. Um, so will the standards be changed to reflect the new diploma at the moment it specifies which diploma is required for each option? Yes, that should be in process now. Okay. Cool. I think we're running out of questions. We do have one quick poll question for you, um, just to see if we can get a few more on the line. Um, it'll be popping up on your screens very, very shortly. And this is, which standards will you be using? And the answers you have are healthcare support worker level two, senior healthcare support worker level three, or assistant practitioner level five. So results of the poll are in. As we can see, 50% of you said you'll be offering the support worker level three, which I'm sure Joe would be very interested to know. Okay, we've, got, we've got a few more minutes for any more questions if you want to type them in and get them through to us. Okay, um, got one question from Tracy Walker. If they fail the endpoint assessment and have to pay the fee, what are the repercussions if they, if they um, choose to pay? Okay. Right, okay, so um, it, it depends really. It's the responsibility of the employer actually to pay for the refits and um, there is guidance around that in terms of what the uh, ESFA and the Institute for Apprenticeships would uh, need to see commitment for employers in that case. Certainly it would not be the responsibility of the apprentice to pay for their refits. Okay. Um, so if you've got any EPA questions, please send them through. We've got our EPA expert, Jane, on the line, who um, hasn't had many questions through so far, so if you've got any, please put them in the box. Um, Geraldine, one more for you. Can 422221 be used as a qualification within adult care worker? Well, I would suggest that um, it, it won't be able to be really because it's 422221, which is the Health and Social Care Diploma, is also going to be replaced by the Diploma in Care Level 2 in January. So, in fact, that qualification will close in December. Okay. Um, one question here from Jill Leach. At what point do you register a learner for EPA? Well, the, the primary um, consideration is has the learner gone through the gateway process and is the learner ready for assessment? So that's the first question that needs to be answered. If that is the case, then the learner can be registered 
and City and Girls will require some notice as to um, when an independent point assessor would need to be appointed to um, carry out the work-based observation, actually, that's, that's the, the crucial part for us. And it, at the same time as that, they would follow on with the professional discussion and interview, that makes sense to do that. So in order for that to happen, really the learner would have had to have um, been successful at their test and would have had to submitted either their portfolio of evidence, their level two, their reflective account, or their learner journal, um, depending on which standard. Um, so, you know, there, there needs to be time for those elements to be uh, completed and then submitted and marked by the assessor. Brilliant, thank you very much. Um, we've come to the end of our questions, we've got no more in the box. So I'd like to say a big thank you to our presenter, Geraldine Dunworth, and also for Jamie, who we have the line to help support. And thank you very much for attending today. We hope to see you shortly.